Again, I'd like to welcome you to the uh, NAL First Thursday program. Today is August 3rd, and I hope y'all are managing to stay cool. It's a little bit warm for those of us who are here in the Lone Star Room, but uh, glad you're here. I'm Lisa Spence, and I am your host for today. Um, our speaker for today is one of our very own NAL members, uh, Dr. Dean Epler. Uh, Dr. Epler is a geologist, field operations person, pilot, and according to him, sort of a systems engineer who began working at Johnson Space Center in 1990. During his time at JSC, he worked on a number of different projects, including conceiving of and leading the team that built the Window Observational Research Facility, more fondly known as WARF, uh, for the ISS. He served as the lead spacesuit test subject for advanced EVA development from 1996 to 2006. And during the Constellation program, he worked with the engineers, managers, and operations personnel to integrate science into the plans for the return to the moon, which is very salient to today. And along with another NAL member, Dwayne Ross, he ran the Astronaut Geologic Training Program from 2009 to 2016. He also ran the infamous Desert Rats program for many years. Dean attended St. Lawrence University for his undergraduate work and completed an MS in geology from the University of New Mexico before making the wise decision to attend my alma mater, Arizona State University, to earn his PhD in geology. In between earning advanced degrees, he was an Army Combat Engineer Officer filling a variety of leadership positions in the 4th Engineer Battalion at Fort Carson, Colorado. Since his retirement from NASA in 2016, Dean has been employed, so much for retirement, Dean has been employed by the Aerospace Corporation, undertaking a number of projects on the technical history of Apollo as they apply, as they apply to future missions to the moon. Uh, Dean's talk today will describe how the Apollo surface missions were planned and executed and how well the Apollo field work represented the geology of the moon, certainly a timely topic as teams at NASA are making their plans for the Artemis missions, which will explore that very same moon. So I am going to turn it over to Dean. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to point out that there's somebody in the audience, Debbie Trainer, who also was one of the unindicted co-conspirators in astronaut field geology training. And um, she just showed me pictures of her daughter getting involved in it. Some people never learn. I don't know. Anyhow, um, so I want to talk to you about some stuff today. And I know, I think I'm the only geologist in the room ever. It's a sort of, I guess you're a geologist, I can never remember. You're a carbon guy, so that, that much I know. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about what geology is about because you have to know that before you know whether we, you know, what we did and how it did. Um, I also wanna talk about how we did the planning for Desert Rats 2010, which Joe was a key member of, as well as myself and a cast of thousands, I think, <laughs> by the time we got done with that test. How what we did in REST 2010 led us to go look and see how things were done in Apollo and how doing geology Apollo style versus what I told the 19th century way, which when you really come right down to it, only recently have we kind of come out of the 19th century in terms of how we do field geology. And then how this re relates back to a whole bunch of questions about our, you know, exploration architectures and things like that. Um, so geologic field work is the way we get data for geology, okay? And this is, I know that's like, you know, who's buried in Grant's tomb, but the reality is that to do geology, you have to go in the field and find the rocks in the first place. Um, I've tried to make people over the years recognize that if you don't know where the field stuff came from and what its relationships are, all you're really doing is walking around in the field collecting rocks, and that's not doing geology. So um, this kind of work, is what we will continue to do on the moon and Mars. It's very different from ISS in terms of the kind of science we do. And, and it's based on a lot of plan of observation of field ops and replanning as you go. Um, field geologists are by their very nature operations uh, analysts because 
your first plan never survives the first 15 seconds of contact with the rocks in the field. And you're constantly having to take what you're learning as you go and, and replan as you go. Um, and when we go to the, back to the moon and when we go to Mars, this is the sort of stuff we're going to be doing. So this is kind of what we to do in the field. And we've done a number of, and are continuing to do a number of analog tests like desert rats. And these have been really critical um, tests to understand how we do what we do. Um, but they also backfeed in the geologic research and that's what I want to talk about. So field studies remain the primary source because the rocks in the field are where the, where, where the data is. If you don't know what the rocks are to start with, then you're really not doing geology. And we'd always like to have exposures like we see at Grand Canyon, but most places look like this. Um, and what you can't see are the mosquitoes and the black flies and the deer flies and the horse flies and the moose flies and everything else that's there. Um, if you strip away all that green stuff and get rid of all the flies, you're still going to be covered, have a landscape covered with a lot of rocks and sand and not too much in the way of bedrock. Bedrock being the stuff that's actually attached to the earth as opposed to a boulder that you know drifted in on the back of a glacier or other some other way of getting there um bob sharp who has sadly passed away now was probably one of the best geologists and field geologists in the 20th century said that doing field geology is about coming up with testable hypotheses in the face of incomplete data and he was really good at doing that. and you know this place this place once you take the trees off so no matter what planet you go to in this case is station four at Apollo 17 you're still going to be dealing with a situation where you don't have all the going and you figure out what everything means um i'll leave you to read that quote but it's you know there's not a field geologist out there whether they're a neophyte or a seasoned one that hasn't really come across Field that makes no damn sense and they have to go back and figure out what's actually going on so so we collect a variety of data but basically it starts position and the geometric attitude of rocks in the field in other words what are they how old are they usually not by the way when i say how old are they we usually don't know how old they are in a numerical sense you know, one of the girls has been a little gizmo that could give you a metric age date, but we still aren't there. So we're really looking at is it older, or older than by virtue of is one on the other, or have they been flipped over, or is there a fault in the way, or things like that. We're also wondering about the geometric attitude. So bed lying this, is it bed lying like that? Is it bed folded? Um, and after we're also trying to figure out the, the forces that are the structures that are created in the force you know, structures in particular, which direction they're coming from. For instance, these folds and these basalts, the, the forces that folded them came from left and right. So it pushed and caused them to rumple up. Besides folding, there's faulting. So, you know, you know, was there a fault? What, which direction did the fault come from? Is it what we call a normal fault or reverse fault? Things like that. All of this is data you collect in the field, and you eventually want to put together a geologic map. Now, a geologic map is simply a two-dimensional distribution of where the rocks are in the field. And so the idea is all the different colors there represent different rock type. And the idea being with this map, if you're coming back later, if you go to a spot on the ground that's rock that is re referred to in the, the explanation is whatever the pink rock is. So it's your first order data set is that geologic map. And it's what geologists use all over, have been using since the 17th or excuse me, 18th century. And despite all the gizmos and tablets and and GPS and everything else, this is still what we're trying to produce as our first order um, data set. Let's see. So why should we worry about this now? As I said earlier, this is different from what we do on ISS. Um, everybody in the room has probably had some interaction with ISS crews, and many of you know that much of the science training on ISS involves 
you know, some class that you might have two years before you actually do a procedure and pull up a computer-based training the day before you have to do something so you remember. Physiology is not like that. It's much more forensic. It's getting out, banging on rocks, knowing where you are in the field, things like that, and trying to correlate not enough data, data, excuse me, not data. And the, the culture of doing that needs to be started now because it requires a lot more training, a lot more experience before uh, an astronaut who's not a geologist can be effective on the lunar surface or on the Martian surface. Um, one of the key things is that the Apollo guys got lots of training. Um, they had about a thousand hours of geology training on the J missions of 15, 16, and 17 before they went to the moon. So they technically were at least as qualified as a master's student in geology. They really knew what they were doing, but they did it because they were going out in the field one week of every month from the time they were named to the crew until they flew. And in some cases, like the Apollo 15 crew had their last field trip three weeks before their launch date. So it required a lot of field training. And if you look out the window, except that over at Mount Cosmo, you're not going to see any bedrock around here. So you can't do it in Bill 9, and you can't do it on the back lot of here or the Cape. So you've got to go to where the rocks are, like, you know, New Mexico, where two fish is sitting looking at the outflow sheets from the Vias Caldera. One of the things we never had a chance to do is field check the Apollo data. One of the things that always happens when you're a graduate student is you go out in the field and do your map. And then there's always that traumatic event where your advisor comes out, field checks your map to see if you got it right or not. Well, that's normal in geology, but we've never had a chance to do that in Apollo. We have always assumed that the methodology we use, particularly for 15, 16, and 17, was correct. So the conclusions that we drew on the basis of the samples and the photogeology were actually what the moon was like, but we've never gone back to the moon, so we've never had a chance to field test that. So keep that in mind. I want to talk a bit about um, the Desert Rats 2010 mission and its origin into something that was called the San Francisco Volcanic Field Project from the MAMA stands for Moon Mars Analog Mission Analysis, I think. It's been a while. Um, in Rats 2010, we did essentially a week long Apollo mission. Um, we had two small pressurized rovers. Uh, simulated pressurized rovers, they drove well over 100 miles uh, on pre-planned pre traverses through the Flagstaff area, Francisco Volcanic Field. The rover crews basically acted like they were on the moon and the, the people that supported them, like Joe, myself, science teams, ops teams, ran control center 24 seven. And it was really a very, very analog, very, very realistic mission. Um, in fact, Jeff Hanley came out to watch one time and said, you guys are doing a real mission. It's just this way whenever you do one. We had a really tremendous team and we had a really good um, test. To get ready for the field exercise, we spent almost a year doing field planning. And we were doing that in a manner similar to what Apollo used to plan the J missions. In fact, we even used the place they did a lot of their training and the personnel that helped do a lot of the planning, which was the USGS and flying staff. So when we started on the left, this is Apollo 17's Traverse Planning data, it's Desert Rats 2010 Traverse Planning. We came out with very similar products and we did very similar training. It was, it was really an Apollo-like mission, even though we didn't actually realize sort of that was what we were doing at the time. Um, in order to, oh, that's me, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, I did. Um, so the, in order to do the planning, what you have to do is get a sense of the geology. And obviously, you know, you couldn't go to the moon before you went to the moon and you did a lot of it with photogeology. Photogeology works by looking at the landforms overhead and trying to make some sense of what might be different geologic units. So that if you look on the left, that's the geologic map of the Apollo 17 area. We use the same techniques to produce the data set that you see in the right in color and use that to plan our traverses. So the color each represent what we consider different rock 
at different ages, ages being ones, if, a, if something's on top of something else, it's younger. So we use a new sort of growth phase. And this was, this was basically the map we used to do our traverse plan, again, similar to Apollo. Now I'm not, you know, the details here aren't that important. Yeah. Ran all is you know, the U.S. did this, and they were a half an hour from the field area. They never went out and field checked. They were they were being very true to the you know essentially the spirit of what we were doing by not actually field checking. So they just generated maps just like Apollo did. And we planned our mission, but they did not go in the field to see if their map was correct. Basically. So this is part of that pre-rest geologic map. And it's around an area called SP Mountain. It's a very young cinder cone and it grew thousands years ago. Um, and it's a very prominent feature. I won't tell you what SP means. You can guess it. If not, I'll tell you off when I'm off mic later. Um, but I'm going to show you a little bit about how we did this. So this is what the map looks like. I know everybody online probably can't see this, but this is SP Mountain. A big this is another older cinder cone or, or volcanic complex. We know it's older because this has been erupted onto the shoulder of that, which means that this had to be there before that was erupted. We have a variety of other units in the washes that we think are probably just dirt. We have a bunch of other units out here that are also lava flows that are different from these. And we have some things that look suspiciously like sedimentary rocks out here that are probably part of the, the Colorado Plateau um, Grand Canyon sequence. So based on this map and the road net, basically having to use the, the roads, we selected places where we could sample each of the units and we sampled them where we could get the rover to sample them. So for instance, telling them, we want them to go up on the top of SP Mountain to get a you know, sample is just not going to fly. So even though we were on Earth, we were on con similar constraints to what you'd have if you were planning a real mission on, a, on the lunar surface. So all through this thing, the scientists work with the rover guys and the ops guys and the comm guys to, for all of us to come up with a workable plan. And that in and of itself was a great training exercise. So we have these spots, the represents outbound, the blue represents inbound. So we came out this way and the size switch group back to our starting. So the different colors represent different weeks of the operation. And figure out path. Yeah, and you couldn't have them driving up and down hills too steep, things like that. We use those to arrive the waypoints in the nav data. So now we've got the blue and the yellow lines in the paper want the rover to go roughly and making sure we access each of the points. And if you notice, there's a point, at least one point in each color, with the exception of this one, because we figured we would be so we would be sampling this guy here. So this is a deflated version without the, the colors of the map. But this is basically what we were trying to do. The difference between what we did on Apollo and what we did here is more just scale and technology, but basically we were running Apollo style operation. So RATS 10 went together really well. We had two weeks of training. Um, we didn't get anybody hurt. We were all friends after, which was really remarkable since most of our brigade um, but one of the things we didn't really know was how well did our field op help the area? And by inference, well, the policy about the moon. So the bottom line is how well do we think of what we really think we know? So in 2012, uh, the geologists from different places took a bunch of engineers from the field to do a week-long boot camp 
in geology because we're going to see how well the field started doing field mapping and just sort of put them in and taught them as we went. Um, and we chose this area because we're in rats, so we thought we knew geology. So um, one fine day, and this is, you notice people up here is Tracy Powell. We were up here, this is quite a ways up above the valley floor. The rat sample was in, and I are looking at the sample and realizing that it's not what we would have expected to see based on the And then we thought, if we didn't get it right on rats, what did we screw up Apollo? But we realized we had asked the question, so we went back and in like in a week and a half, written a proposal that was actually got funded. Um, then we realized if we found out that we didn't, well, one of us was going to up at LPSC, uh, everything you know is wrong, and neither of us in that position, but nevertheless, we did particularly field checking the Apollo approach. So what we decided to do was have two teams that would operate independently. What we were trying to figure out is you get your geologic data. And one team we used the information that we developed from rats to the information that we developed during Samples and use that all to take a look back at the print and geologic map, modify it off it based on the, essentially the Apollo like data. And the second team work independently, basically just go play 18th century or 17th, excuse me, 19th century geologists, go out and do what we would normally do in the situation if we weren't on any other project. And, and then we, you know, the idea was we take these. Generate the, the map and a new map based on the modification. Looked about the same. Because if they looked about the same, then I don't know. So that was basically how we did it. And the key thing was it was we didn't know what the field, the lab team was up with the lab team had no idea what we were doing in the field until a whole year to the project because we didn't want each other contaminating the other guy's ideas the next step that once we decided we were going to do this the idea was let's figure out how to get the area because if the area will be too complicated so we area chose sp mountain area one because it had a lot of coverage from the rats mission and so to get stuff done about we about two weeks because we had about two weeks to do the field work. So again, going back to our our geologic or ugly purple geologic map, going back and that's where we were in the mats. So this is basically you see the red outline there. That was our field there. So that was what we would take apart and see what was going on. So the lab activity had a huge data set. They had a lot of collected samples. Second, they had literally hundreds of hours of true crew voice transcript. Third, they had photographs. And fourth, they had videos. And if you just look at this uh, rather elaborate backpack that Jose is here, it has basically a digital still camera, a digital video camera. And on his arm is a essentially electronic cuff checklist. So we generated a ton of data, science data on the field area. By the way, every crew was composed of an astronaut and a geologist. So we were we had essentially four astronauts, four geologists. So we had a lot of geological expertise in the field at the time. So we they then took all that data and, and put it onto an RTS GIS map, similar to the ones we were using to do to do what we were doing in the field. And this is essentially what we did after the crew came with the samples and everything else. Field team went out in the field and we had Four bases we're trying to figure out. Now, lava flow unit, there were out there, were there more than one sedimentary unit? And what's the, the nature of the dirt sitting around? Is it just dirt? 
that accumulates or is there something special about the dirt, like another eruption that we didn't actually know about? We mapped to about one to 24,000 scale and mapped it down onto one to 20, 12,000, so we got higher detail. We spent about eight days in the field, prim primarily mapping one volcano, which was, had been identified in 87, and you know, kind of went back to that volcano. Now, the next couple of maps will show you how we the field. There's a couple of things here. The, the yellow are the past lines, the red is the outline, and then the maroon is where we went. So that's originally where rats went. That's where we went. And the key access to the terrain was we were on foot almost entirely, except where you see a, a traverse along a road. We primarily did it on foot. So we were not constrained by, you know, having a rope and having stop and only work around that rover and constrained with the rover up on the of a volcano. So these are all the traverses that, uh, these are all specific spots where we stopped and either took a sample, took photographs, took some kind of measurement, or in, in this case with field geologists and well, you always got to stop and talk about something. So for us flapping our trying to figure out what we're seeing. Those were all the samples that we recorded. So we get everything done, come back, we build our map, the lab team builds their map, and then we start to look. So this is the lab team map. If you remember a little bit about the desert map, the original map, this has more detail in it. But this is essentially a modification of the Dead Rats 2010 map based on just looking at the return data and the return samples from the field. Um, there are a couple of things that really, one is they found, found a single limestone unit. So there's only one sedimentary unit that everything ever worked on. Um, they were able to determine on the basis of what, looking at the samples, they thought they had five different um, lava flows. And one of the details of the info, maybe two, couldn't really tell whether there were two volcanic events um, other than SP Mountain. And then there were some associated dirt, you know, what we in geology call collodium, you know, that's that sort of come down and covered the good stuff, covered the rock and a lot of things. Um, they put a lot more detail on the desert rats map. And, and this is very similar to what you saw after Apollo, where once we got all this and all the true observations, you were able to refine the map, the pre-mission map. This is what the field team came up with. By the way, again, um, you can't really see it very well, but there's red, you, red lines in there. That's the desert. So this is the jail field team. Now it's different and there's some more detail. In some cases, there's less detail, but basically uh, the two maps look about the same. Um, like I said, if they didn't, uh, one of us was to get up to the LPS and, and catch flack for telling everybody that everything thought we about who about the moon was wrong. Um, one of, there are several things that I think were really critical. One is we identified about this number of lava flows, but we definitely identified more events than they were able to from the RATS data. Um, in addition to that, we found a number of Volcanic units that don't weren't seen on mass that be there was a bigger out there that nobody's ever written about, and that was not obvious orbital data. One of the key things is that a lot of the units that field team decided were excuse me the lab team decided were primary lava flows. In other words, there's a vent like everybody's seen in Hawaii. The lava comes up and falls downhill or in fact, something a lot different. Um, very often when you're erupting something like a, a cinder cone, where and everybody's seen this, where you get the fountain come out and little pyroclast go in, pyroclast being those bits of rock that come out molten. If the accumulation rate of the pyroclast is high enough, they can't get rid of their heat. So in other words, you're piling up a whole bunch of very hot stuff, and because you're piling hot stuff on hot stuff, pretty soon, that turns into a lava flow. And it's called a rheomorphic flow or a secondary lava flow. And a lot of the places that rats identified as primary lava flows 
secondary. That's probably one of the key things, and it's all about getting in the screen, and it's all about getting, kind of getting your nose to the outcrop and seeing more than just what you see from alongside the road. So we did see more, and there is a different interpretation on the map, but that interpretation is not wildly out of line with what the, what the lab team said. So the point was that, so this is something we generated, and this is, this is showing how the eruption started in place. Uh, things happen. We were able to get from being able to go to that level of access to the field that the laboratory team did have, did not have. Having said that, this doesn't change basic interpretation field area that we came out of desert rats. Glory, hallelujah. You know, it says that Apollo did it right. And I think that's really a key part of what's important for how we continue to go about going to the moon. This is just another comparison of the maps. Again, various levels of detail. There's one of the problems with geology is lumping, well, lumping versus splitting. Is it two units or is it one unit? Two that look slightly different or one same. You know, that's, that's arcana for geology. But you that from a free, uh, orbital photograph. You can't do it from the field. But again, it doesn't change the base interpretation of what went on down there geologically. Um, yeah, like I said, we put it Apollo. Um, but it also showed that there are significant gaps that can come if you're just doing a quick land, do three days of traverses and come back. And it also says something, and Jack Schmidt has talked about this a lot, is if he was able to go back to Taurus Litro, there's about half a dozen places he thinks could or improve our interpretation of the geology of that site. The point is, we find we go back to the same area. But the other really important that you have is how much more do you want to know? So the conclusions and the implications for exploration. First, if we continue to do Paul, we're doing it right. The second, the more we have and the deeper you get in the field, the more detail you will have. But you will probably not do order to change what you're interpreting in the field if you're just doing a quick reconnaissance like Apollo did. Um, access is, we got places on foot that the rat crew couldn't get because they couldn't take the rovers there. The more, you know, the classic thing is the best geologist of the needs of most rocks, but the best field map is the one where you've gone more places to feel. So if you time giving the car access to an area that you're trying to make sense of is better than less. One key thing that I think is really important, we talked about a lot when we were in the field, both when we were just the field team and then when, when the lab team came out after we were comparing our maps is, you can always learn new, but your actual rate of knowledge capture goes up steeply initially and then tends to flatten out. So we've had this discussion over the years of what's better, a whole bunch of sortie missions or, or commit early to one big outpost. In terms of science, the, the longer you get a place, that's you learn per unit time after a certain point. And if you look at this curve down here, this is kind of how we feel like we we, we got it. Pre rat rats pre ten uh, rats ten pre mission planning was about here. We got to about here with what we had from the, the post mission stuff. We were able with by taking the field stuff and the lab stuff, drag it up to here. So it is pretty quick. That thing flattened out. And yes, you could go back and spend a lot more time there, but are you going to drastically change your interpretation of what's going on? And the answer is probably not. In fact, curves like this are used, and these are called creaming curves in the oil industry. And this is how they decide when they've got about as much out of a reservoir as you're going to get. And it's time to plug the holes and go someplace else. So, you know, have to think about this in terms of you know what you're doing and your your planning um, for a future mission. So lessons learned. 
the rats data violated Apollo style um, uh, exploration operation. The rats 10 data is still useful for learning stuff and I hope they haven't lost it because there's a lot of things, a lot of the rats 10 data in particular. Um, if you do well executed analog programs, you can learn about a lot about how to do a field operation on the moon or Mars. Um, but every science mission can reach knowledge saturation where you simply are not going to not going to learn more for what you're doing. As I said, you have to drive four hours each way to get an hour on the outcrop. That's probably not a good use of crouton. And that's when you start to think about doing sorties or moving the base or whatever. So um, I think that's about where I'm going to end. I'll answer any questions. But for those of you in Apollo, you did it right. And this is proof. So thank you very much. Yeah. In regard to the upcoming Artemis program on the screen, the division back on the moon yeah. in the polar region, is there anything that's going to change in the way we're going to do our analog testing for these two numbers? You know, I don't know. I've I've done I've been called in to look at a little bit of that stuff. Um, this is that's probably a good question for Barbara. Barbara Rose. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the question was, are we going to change? The, is the, the plans for going on Artemis, going on Artemis to the South Pole, how does that change what we're going to do in terms of analog testing? And I think probably not. Um, the ultimate question is how much time you want to put into that. I don't know what their plans are on that right now. But I do know they've been doing some, some testing, some small, you know, week-long tests of stuff. So um, they're, they're finding out something like, that the Apollo 14 crew is is dragging crap through the field. It just doesn't work very well to what planet, but I don't think they've learned that exactly yet. So, yeah. All right. Um, so, you showed the asymptotic learning curve. Yeah. Um, there was a huge amount of learning between the desert rats field work and the field work that y'all did when you went back. Is that a significant amount of time in the field to accumulate that, that jump in knowledge. So what are the implications there? Blowing back into, you know, the sorties on the moon, you know, how much time would they need to spend to get to the point where it becomes, where the asymptote kind of levels off? Okay, so the question was, um, where, how, do, how would the asymptote level off both for Artemis and Apollo, basically? Is, how and how much take? time would it take? And all right, let me, I'll tackle the Apollo question first because I've actually, we, we talked about. Um, so Apollo went to a variety of different terrains. We started out at flat, pretty interesting in terms of people like lava flows, but otherwise not very interesting with the rest of what we did on Apollo. On Apollo 11 and 12 and got to progressively steeper and more complex terrains uh, through 14, 15, 16 and 17. I would not go back to Apollo 11 or 12. I think we have got, we're going to learn at those spots as a basic clean order. So you were surf sampling the tops of a bunch of lava and gadgets and pieces that were thrown in from other places. Um, Jack Schmidt has actually written a very interesting paper on how he would go back to Apollo 17 site and he would probably spend at least a month at the Apollo 17 site with a couple of crew members. This is a longer distance rover and a little bit more elevation. And I think that would be a good assessment of how long it would take to do that. We did discover a lot of really interesting stuff on in Apollo that were actually at the Apollo 17 site that we literally are still arguing about, you know, 50 years later at Lunar Planetary Science Conference. And we don't really have the answer to those arguments. We have opinions, but we don't have. So I would say from don't bother going back to 11 and 12 to go back to something like Apollo Apollo 17 site or 16 site for a month. That's probably what I would say is, is what we what you do. So, yeah. Public domain. Uh, <laughs> That's funny. We have tried to get this published several places. Um, the problem is, is that the ops journals don't want any of that shit about rocks. Literally is what they've said that to me. And the science journals wonder why we're wasting everybody's time with operations. 
So I haven't yet been able to get this report out into a public domain. We have made presentations at many national meetings and these slides are available and, and you're you're welcome to, but it's we're we're sitting in that Venn diagram and signed journals usually don't want anything that rolls into somebody else's terrain. So we're still trying to find a place to put this because it's still important. So was it published as a mass document? Uh no, it was not. <laughs> yeah, I know. That that's probably a good thing to do. We were trying to get it published. One of the last things that is that and retirement was submitted to a journal. And again, that was Act Astronautica, and they wanted me to cut out all the geology stuff. And I argued that if I cut out all the geology stuff, I understand what the heck we're talking about. So I pulled the paper when I would. Yeah, yeah, Luis. Yes. Will the search for, for ice forecasts affect what you're doing or be part of it? Okay, so that's it. So the question is would the search for ice on the on the polar caps affect what we're doing? So that's that adds literally a third dimension into the discussion. And the problem with searching for ice on the on the polar caps is I, you know, some of the numbers I've seen from various people who have modeled, you have to get at least a, a meter of regolith over your volatiles before the volatiles can no longer in effect communicate with the surface. The bottom line is if you took an ice cube and threw it out on the lunar surface, it wouldn't it wouldn't melt, but it would evaporate. And eventually it would be gone. If you buried it only under about that much regolith, there's still enough free pass between regolith grains that eventually it would go away. So you have to get down to at least a meter. Um, that means that you're not going to get much in the way of understanding of volatiles on the surface doing surficial geology, and that's where drilling comes in. So that's um, we didn't do any drilling here. By the way, they have gone out based on our stuff and started to do geophysics to try and look at what's underneath the stuff on the surface. Because again, geology, even though it's sort of human scale three dimension, there's still a heck of a lot that you don't know what's going on underneath. So, yes. So yes. You know, it's curious. Um, it, it, uh, how does the geology training uh, for on orbit geology, like Apollo 8 or the Fan Module Pilot, um, differ from the surface geology training? And, and do you see a difference uh, as you go to the Artemis 2 and 3 um, in, the, in the Apollo training model to Ar the Artemis model? And what, how are they? Yeah, um, so the question is effectively how does the um, the or training for orbital geology um, differ from field geology, and how did it differ on Apollo, and and how does it differ on Artemis? So let me tackle the first in the beginning. On Apollo, they had a guy by the name of Farouk El Baz, who was a really good scientist. He was part of a, an organization called Belcom, and Farouk was originally from Egypt, but emigrated to the United States. And he took under his wing essentially all the command module pilots and taught them a lot about what you look at from orbit. And so the, the, the key benefit on orbit is that you're seeing the whole moon. And when you're on the surface, you're seeing maybe four or five square kilometers. So you're seeing a small area in detail on the ground and a lot in less detail on orbit. So a lot of the training for the command module pilots was what do you look for? You know, what's what's usual, what's unusual, because you don't you don't want, you know, this is also the key with training the crew is in the field doing sampling is, you know, everybody goes to the to the weird stuff. And that's great. You know, the rock that stands out is not is not from around there. And you want to know that. But you want the non weird stuff, too, because the weird stuff may be exciting, but not really relevant to the general picture of the site. So the same with looking down from orbit. What do you see that just, you know, characterize what's normal and characterize what's unusual? So we started a program just again as I was going out the door um, doing doing T-38 flights. And um, I don't know how far that's gone. I set it up with a bunch of the crew members to start doing training from orbit. Um, I do know that for on, on a lot of the J mission detailed field uh, activities, while the crew was down on the ground doing their training, the command module pilots were flying over the site several times from an altitude roughly equivalent to what they would be over 
similar size terrain on the lunar surface. So the, there used to be a guy here by the name of Dick Laidley, who was a, a, an Air Force Reserve pilot, but he was an ophthalmologist, and he would fly front of it, and, you know, they basically sideways, and the, the uh, command module pilot would be describing the geology by voice transcript while they flew over. And then, again, just like the crew, when they would come down from it, then they would critique it, so they got very good. Ken Mattingly, in particular, gave one of the best talks I've ever seen in an astronaut give at the, the fourth Lunar Science Conference and what he saw from the moon or from orbit of the moon. It was just stunning. It was awesome. So I'm, I'm sure we're going to get to that. Uh, I don't think we've actually gotten down to brass tacks on how, you know, the first mission is supposed to leave somebody on orbit. But, you know, if you've got a month long mission on the surface, keeping some poor schlub running around the command module for a month is not what I'd call it. it's good use of a crew member's time. So I'm hoping pretty soon you'll have four guys on the moon and not, you know, on the command will just be rude. So I don't know in, in, uh, is, the, is the answer. So. Yes. Could you put an estimate on the value of Jack Smith going on Apollo 17 versus uh, an untrained geologist getting a crash course? Okay. What percentage of what did we get? Um, okay, let me, so the question was, um, what was the delta between uh, the J mission crew, uh, test pilot, trained to be a geologist, and Jack Smith, who was a um, professional geologist when he came into the core. So that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, so one of the things that I always remind people who really don't know much about the space program, or tell people who don't know much about the space program, is that all of the astronauts in Apollo who were pilots were test pilots. And, and a test pilot is a scientist or an engineer with a piece of hardware they're testing. And even though there's a lot of data that's collected, there's a lot of things about flying characteristics and stuff, very subtle things that they have to be able to underst understand, observe, record, and correlate in the test flight. So when they come back, they can say, yeah, this is what your data showed, but this is what I felt in the airplane. So you were starting with a, with a group of people that were already really good at technical observation. And then all you did was take that technical observation skill and turn it in another direction and get them turned on with geology. So one thing is that all of the crews did very well. Some the 15, 16, and 17 crew were awesome. And um, the training held, you know, the training worked and they did a super job on the moon. Um, what Jack brought to the picture, and I think it's a really good way of thinking about it. But Jack Brock, the picture is his ability to look around in about 30 seconds and characterize a particular area and realize what they needed to sample, what they needed to do observations on. And that that's where, in effect, I think he earned his pay. If you look at the transcripts on, on 17 or you watch the videos, what you always see is they come to a stop and Gene Cernan handles all the housekeeping stuff. And Jack gets off and he spends about a minute just walking around and looking. He doesn't say anything except occasionally say, this is what I'm doing. And then he stops and he starts giving a recitation, essentially field notes verbally of what he sees in the area. None of the other crews did that. It does not denigrate what they were doing and bringing back. But to, to, to my mind, that was where Jack was earning his pay, was that I that he had trained for many years doing field geology, seeing that stuff. Um, to me, the classic case of how we, well we train the Apollo crews, the mission was supposed to be going to a place that were a specific kind of volcano that um, we hadn't seen on the moon. And when the decision made to go there, we didn't know enough about the moon yet from other sites to say we wouldn't see that kind of. So the crew was trained to look at for ash flow, we call ash flow toss and volcanic domes and all that stuff. And the geologic map that was really emphasized that as the interpretation of the field there. So the 16 crew gets down and they're just saying, man, we ain't seeing nothing but breaches, 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 and breaches. And everyone said, no, no, there must be ash flow tests on there. Keep looking. No, no, there's just breaches. Oh, you must be wrong. There are ash flow tests. So they went through the whole damn mission arguing back and forth about where the ash flow tests were. And when they came back, they said, holy cow, there's nothing but breaches here. You know, and 
you can imagine what John Young had to say about that. But the, <laughs> the bottom line was their training was good enough to recognize that what they expected to see was not what they were seeing, and they just ignored those other yeah, who's on the other end of the phone? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, he was. And there's a there's a great quote from a debrief from the Apollo uh, Lunar Surface Journal, where Cernan says, "You know, Jackson, I'm I'm a guy. he was my co pilot. That was great. He did a great job. Once we got on the moon." I'm not a geologist. I've had a lot of training, but he's the geologist. So now I'm his field assistant. And I always and crew members and scientists to say, look, this is how you want to train your crews. Because you're never going to get away from having pilots. And you're never going to get away from having other people besides geologists on the mission, because that's part of doing it. But this is how you want to train, and this is how you want to operate. So yeah. any, yeah, Rob. Being on uh, 15, Dave Scott was the only one that did a stand-up EVA interview after landing yeah. kind of right to the order site before they went out. Um, not, nobody else did that. And I was curious, looking forward, is that a good thing to do from a geology perspective where, where it did not add that much to it? What should they do those yeah. in the future? Uh, the general record ordering at the site before they go out? So the question was on Apollo 15, Dave Scott, after they landed, this is what we call a stand-up EVA, where he opened the top hatch and stood up on the acid engine cover and looked around because he could, you know, you could open up the hatch and there was there it was, there was the world. And they did that for a couple of reasons, but the primary one was because they weren't, they didn't have the best photography and they weren't really sure how trafficable the area was. So they wanted to get a sense of that. Um, from um, from Dave's perspective. And he turned it into a great dissertation about what he was seeing in overall standpoint. And I thought it was great geologically. And I was always disappointed we didn't do it on 16 and 17. And I've never, to be honest with you, I've never been able to find any a memo or something that says stand up EVA on Apollo 16 or whatever, and said, we will not do it because of this. So I don't, and nobody seems to remember I mean, I've literally asked people, I don't know, gee, we can do, we didn't, uh, I don't know why we did, didn't, I think it was a great idea. A lot of it depends on what the lander configuration is. A lot of the newer landers are putting you up high anyway, so you almost don't have to open the top hatch to look out. So I think it's great. Geologists always want, I mean, you saw that one picture with Barb Tewksbury and Tracy Caldwell way the hell up the, above the terrain looking out because you're seeing, okay, I think that's like that. And that's one of the ways you plan and where to go. You know, you see it as much as you, you can. So it's a great idea. I don't know if we'll do it or not. Yes, sir. A long time ago, I used to read about uh, Ilmenite on the moon and being able to get oxygen out of the Ilmenite. And I just wondered, how, how do you get comfortable with a, an area on the moon where there's maybe, hopefully, enough Ilmenite to get enough uh, oxygen out of it so that that's where you put all your heavy mining equipment? Well, you know, that's a, that's a great question. Um, we have the LRO. Oh, so the question was, you know, how do you, if we're going to do ISRU, basically, how do you get comfortable with your place before you end up putting a lot of stuff down to do it? And, you know, this is this is a classic geology mining question, you know, on Earth as well is, you know, you think you have an ore deposit and you're trying to make a decision about how much money to commit to it, because in the end, an ore deposit is literally defined as something you can make money on. And if you can't make money on it, it's a geochemical anomaly. And that's just that. Um, the, the example I was given when I was an undergraduate was there's a ton of cubic miles of seawater. But to process a cubic mile of seawater and extract the gold would cost more money than it would to sell the gold even today. So that means that the gold in the seawater is a geochemical anomaly. That's a great question. And the whole, I, I, we just had a, a thing I was at in uh, DC on architectures. And I stood up after the first session and said, 
you know, you guys are talking about ISRU, but I don't see anything in here about ISRU. And my God, you'd think I pulled a pin on a grenade and rolled it into the middle of the room and ducked. I mean, I was pretty embarrassed because I didn't realize, you know, that, that we don't know. Here's the key thing right now is we have uh, access to a resource now that we didn't have on Apollo, which was LRO. Um, LRO has gotten so much great data now that our ability and not only visual data but you know geochemical data and all that stuff that we we will you know we have a better idea but at some point you have to go down first with people and say all right is it there or not with before you then fly in all the big mining equipment and start digging up and that's that's the classic mining problem um and it has been in trust relief for years is you know when do you commit to a mine because when you commit to a mine you're spending big bucks and you better be able to make money on it or your stockholders are going to be finding another management team so anyhow hope that answered the question it's it's a hard question we don't really know yet so got a trivia question yes what lean on Oh, oh, God. The, the, so the question is, why are we going at lunar geology instead of selenology? Because then it would be areology, and then it would be symbiology, and then it would be hermiology, and then is it uh, one, two, four, three, two tautisology? And it's just easier to call it geology. <laughs> oh, the answer? I don't know. Who's the guy out of G USDS named Gene? Shoemaker. Shoemaker. They, they named the uh, shoemaker. Okay. Asteroid, they practiced in the shoemaker. Yeah, all the astrogeology, that kind of set it. Decision, and I heard it. it oh, really? Right. No one would know what the hell we were talking about if we said the phenology of the world. Right. And that's what I said. You'd have to have a different word for every planet, and, and it just gets ridiculous. So, in the end, whatever. I have one more question. Are we going to run out of time? Or? Okay. Yes, sir. Let's do a metal. Uh, Extraction on the moon will require a lot of power. What's yes. the nature of the power plant to be used? Okay, now you're now you're starting to move into engineering topics. I don't know what's the nature of the power plant. So I do know they've talked about nukes um, and small and reactor. Um, there's also abundant solar. You know, I mean, you know, we can, you know, that, that we don't have to worry about clouds, dust in the air, air in the air. Um, so you have tremendous amount of solar. Um, there's there's power plenty on the moon, depending on how you want to utilize it and whether you want a full 24-7 cycle or whether you want to shut down every 14 days because this the sun's going over the horizon. So the power's there. The problem is finding the, the problem is always making the decision to do it and making the decision to do it based on enough information that it's not a foolish decision. And I said earlier that in geology, you always talk about an order deposit as whether something you can make money on or not. Obviously, we're not selling lunar oxygen to the earth. We've got plenty of it here. But the ultimate the discu the discussion point becomes how much down mass does it take to bring it down in cans and not have to dig it out of the ground versus how much material do you have to bring down at one time to dig it up and use it? And where do those curves cross? And we don't know yet. And we just don't have enough data yet to say. So, any any questions online? I've got them. Oh, we got one. Oh, we got online questions. Sure. Okay, so a uh, couple of couple of questions from online. First of all, from Marianne. To practice for Mars, how does looking for life signs drive where you might sample? Can this even be practiced on the moon? Um, okay, so I'm not a biologist. And I'm not proud to say I avoided biology when I was an undergraduate. So you're talking to the wrong person to a large extent. But I do know that there are, you know, there are biosignatures at a macro scale. You know, critters, critters do stuff. And, and the, the perfect example of in a, in a uh, if you go to anybody who's ever been to Yellowstone has gone to the, the uh, and to the hot springs where you have these wonderful flow stones that are also full of this slimy looking stuff that it turns out it's a, a some kind of algae or slime that just loves being at you know the ph of four and a temperature of 190 centigrade you know that sort of thing so there those things are creating structure that you can look for and so that's easily taught on the earth i don't think you can teach that on the moon because the other way is is there something there you can't see 
And, you know, one of the things we did on Apollo, I think is pretty conclusively proved that there's no, we don't have to worry about bugs on the moon any other than what we bring, um, which is another question. But Mars is a more complicated thing. Joe and I spent a lot of time in our careers working planetary protection, which was, you know, how do we, how do we keep the guy in the suit from sliming a potential Mars uh, life venue? Um, remember we had that one group from uh, Ames, yep. astrobiologists, yep. who were very interested in the dry lakes on the bed, yep. and they were looking for cupa and materials. They said, it's not going to be on the surface. Break open the rock, and there it is. Yes. So a lot of the stuff was Joe. Joe is pointing out that a lot of that we talked with, we worked a lot with Ames guys on astrobiology for for geology for spacesuit ops, and they pointed out a lot of it's going to be the the evidence is going to be in in samples and things like that. But one of the things we we always had to worry about, and we we shocked and awed the science, the, the planetary protection community by pointing out to them the spacesuits leak. And they leak whatever's inside the spacesuit and I'll leave that up to everybody's imagination. And now we have these whole regions on Mars we call special regions of interest. And that came about because of the recognition that you probably can't kind of suit, send a human crew member into that area initially without worry, without expecting that some biological material is going to come out of the suit and potentially contaminate the site. Whereas you can you can probably de-slime a rover a lot quicker than you can make a suit that doesn't leak or you know. So the bottom line is we probably can't teach that on the moon. We can teach procedures, we can teach ops practices, but the real teaching of what to look for is going to be on here. Okay, and that actually kind of feeds into a little bit the, the next question. Can you talk about going forward and finding out more about what's below the surface? So, um, yes. So I spent, like every geologist, I've spent a goodly portion of my career doing what's called sitting a rig, which means you're the geologist on site, and I always got that somehow, I always got the great because drove rigs run 24 seven. And um, so I got to know a lot about drilling. And if you're gonna go deeper than about 10 meters, you've gotta have a, a drill rig and it's gotta be pretty big and it's gotta have drill string and it's gonna have all the accoutrements to get at a certain depth, which we're eventually gonna have to have. Uh, we're certainly gonna need it on Mars. Um, yeah, how much we're gonna need on the moon because we really don't know what volatile are where and what depth. Um, right now, we're not planning for that simply because we don't have mass. To, to, and even a small truck mounted drill rig is pretty damn heavy. And getting our surface and operating it safely is you know, non-trivial. I remember thinking when I was a rig geologist that they about the only place that looked worse than um, that yourself being bad is on a, on a flight deck of an aircraft carrier during flight ops. There's more metal and people and stuff flying around that could take you out in a heartbeat. So drilling holes in the ground is very complicated, very heavy, very time consuming and very difficult thing. We will have to learn how to do it eventually, but we're not, that's not in the plans right now. Any more? Well, as far as I'm Any other questions? Um, <laughs> all right <laughs> okay all right well we don't seem to have any further questions or so again i'd like to uh thank dean uh for sharing his his time and his knowledge with us um thank everybody for for attending today appreciate you being here like i said the um the recording it looks like we actually got a recording this time the recording should be available in a couple of days on the NAL website. So, and uh, Dean has mentioned that he will um, allow his charts to be available. So, uh, we'll we'll make sure that we can get those available to you also on the NAL website. Um, there, unfortunately, sad to announce, there is no keg of the month today. So, y'all are going to have to head off to your own personal favorite water holes. Uh, it's too hot to be outside anyway. Um, our next meeting will be on September 7th.
Yes, it's on September 7th, so hopefully I'll be able to join us then. And the good folks here at Gilruth have asked me to let y'all know, in case you haven't seen the announcements in, in the roundup, um, JSC is going to be having an open house on October 14th. Uh, so put that on your calendars. Uh, it's, it's a Saturday. So first time in quite a while that JSC is gonna have a, an open house. And I know between now and October, you'll hear about it more. I'm, I'm sure we'll be sending out some announcements about it, but it'll be a great opportunity to uh, not only get back on site, which of course we can all do anyway, uh, but to, to really be able to get into some buildings into some areas that um, you know are not generally accessible or at least not very easily. So with that, I'm going to, yes. One other note, October 14th is also the annual eclipse. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, Denny's reminding me that that also, October 14th, also happens to be the date of the annular eclipse. Uh, so keep your eye on the sky for that. So, <laughs> yeah, Houston's not the best place to be. I, I think that, yeah, a little bit further south from here, I think, is where the, the penumbra is going to be the best. Yes. It's also the day of the wings over Houston Air Show. Okay, I knew there was a lot going on on that day. So wings over Houston that day, and and I'm sure that it's somebody's birthday. But I think with that, we're going to uh, we're going to close it down for right now. Again, really appreciate everybody's time, and y'all stay uh, cool and safe out there. See you next month.